Integration is something I haven't talked a lot about, but it is something that can be pretty difficult. Like most things that come up in one's mathematical education over the spread of years of learning, many different versions of integration are taught at different levels of rigor, and as one progresses through more advanced topics, the rigor of the previous versions are not always good enough for arguments of certain calculations and proofs. This always muddled the intuition of what integration was for me, so I wanted to go ahead and go through my five levels of learning what integration was to try and just condense the intuition into one continuous stream. So I'm not gonna get too bogged down in the details here. There might be a little bit of ranting, but anyway, here we go. Number one, area. So you've got a square, a triangle, and a rectangle all in front of you, and the question is, how much area does each shape occupy? You may not think of it as integration, but we put these shapes on a graph and go ahead and integrate them to answer the question, whatever that means. Because at this point in your mathematical career, integration is a big word. You probably haven't seen this symbol before, and you probably haven't even plotted these guys on grids before. If the first time you had to calculate area, someone gave you this equation, which just forms a triangle, with the x-axis, you'd probably give up. It'd be too much all at once, so we don't do that at all. Instead, geometry, and you geometry until, well, you see something like this. Which brings me to number two, Riemann sums. Here we are. All you've known as area thus far has been in the form of formulas attributed to different shapes and terribly intense geometric calculations for those that don't fit into your formula arsenal. And then the guy at the board squiggles and tells you, find the area under the curve. At this point in your mathematical career, you know what the plane is and how to graph a function, but this function is still scary even though you can draw it out. And when you do, you see it, the triangle and you kind of laugh a little bit and go, oh, that's stupid, it's, it's just a triangle and move on with life. But here we are faced with a squiggle and an area to compute. So what do you do? The guy at the board starts talking about Riemann and his rectangles, but you're upset because you built up a geometric formula bank somewhere in your brain, and as it turns out, you only need one of them. Then he starts to go on about trapezoids, and your brain tries to retrieve that formula, which is one of, is it, no, yeah, it's, it's this one. And suddenly you're okay with rectangles. But your brain ditches the geometry because these formulas went on the board and you're hardwired to take formulas as fact at this point. As you record, you lose sight of the fact that these products and the sums are just rectangles, one of the sums having larger rectangles than the other. The other formula with trapezoids attached you forget immediately, never to recall it again, as it looks significantly worse than the other two and it won't be on your test. And then you hear the words, used to estimate, in the fog of committing these formulas to memory, and you get a little sad because you like math because of its exactness, but don't worry, we've gotten to three, the storm of formulas. Shortly after your dip into rectangling, you'll move on and finally look at the process of computing with this symbol, the integral. There'll be some functions and this weird dx thing at the end, which you're only told is a really, really small length on the x-axis or something like that, where we're integrating with respect to x or something similar. And then by some miracle, formulas from differentiation you learned at some point, usually sometime before learning about Riemann sums, magically gives you another list of formulas. As it turns out, some of the squiggles you estimated area for actually have really nice answers, but over the next few months, you'll realize that you'll want your smaller briefcase of geometric formulas back because the hulking burden of memorizing all of these formulas is something you wish to avoid in life. Never mind that you still don't really know why these integral formulas work, or what the dx even means, but thankfully there's four. Riemann integration. Well, at this point in your mathematical career, you've probably already had a class on proofs, and you've shifted from primarily computation-based work to proof-based work. Whenever a computation comes up, your brain scrambles a little bit, and you're very concerned with your current abilities in arithmetic, but fear not, you're probably right at or near the end of a term of a class called Real Analysis, or something similar, which throws out the hulking burden of formulas you learned back in high school calculus for the purposes of computation, and instead focuses on the logic and rigor of calculus. At this point, the words Riemann integrability will show up in some form, and you'll start talking about partitions and upper and lower sums, calling back to the Riemann sums used to estimate integrals way back when, and if you're understanding what's going on, that's exactly what's going on. 
At this point, you're familiar with infimums and supremums, even though they usually make you think a little bit harder than you'd like to, and you end up proving this statement, where u of f is the upper integral of f and l of f is the lower integral of f defined as so. Afterwards, we get to the definition of Riemann integrability, but if you look around, they mean Darbo integrability, but no one really cares, because the two are actually equivalent. Never mind the dx that appeared in your past endeavors with integration that always threw you off. We're just going to leave it out in this version. For someone that enjoys the exactness of math, there is rigor, and it finally feels like it makes sense, or, well, it will, you'll eventually get there. At this point, you still have to digest the definition. However, there is more to learn to make this even more mathematically dense and interesting as five, Lebesgue integration and measure theoretic integration exist. Now, you spent quite some time learning about analysis, and more recently, you've been spending time with this new animal called a measure. And even though this function still throws you for a loop, this one is even scarier because you can't actually draw it out and you can't attack it with Riemann integration. There's a lot of work with sets, and you haven't seen a graph in a while, but then the professor puts a couple of words on the board, Lebesgue integrability. And once you see it, you take a second wondering how this is at all different from Riemann's version of integration. And you get a little freaked out that there is a d mu there too, instead of a dx. It's okay though, after the brief panic, that d mu is just notational, saying that we are integrating with respect to the measure mu, and in our case, it's the Lebesgue measure. But that still doesn't feel like a rigorous version of the very small length or respect to x that dx used to represent in your past mathematical endeavors. But you haven't thought about it in a really long time. Eventually, you realize that the main difference between Riemann integration and Lebesgue integration, or measure theoretic integration in general, is that the partition is a measurable one instead of a list of intervals. So now, essentially, you have more freedom in breaking up the interval that you're working with. And then with a bit of help from your time hanging out with measures, you realize that the Lebesgue integral of that scary function you couldn't draw is just zero, and that feels a bit anticlimactic. Anyhow, that's all I have for this video. If you enjoyed it, go ahead and give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more mathematics videos. As always, I am Nathan, this is Chalk, and I will see you next time.